your parents worked in the film industry and your mother's sister is Agnieszka Holland. How was it growing up in an artistic family? Well, this is something I... Uh, it's just marked my life. I have obviously no comparison to normal families. Uh, it was just the way I was brought up. Um, mostly surrounded by uh, people involved in, in film, uh, but also in music. Uh, my father was a very musically talented person and he uh, really introduced me to uh, a lot of music. I remember going with him to jazz concerts at the age of five. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's definitely shaped me. Uh, and I don't think I would be able to have a different life. When did you decide to become a composer? Was there a certain series or film? Well, my decision to become a film composer was, it came very early. I, one of these incredible figures that, that uh, my parents were inviting to our home was a uh, film music composer Zbigniew Preisner. And he was a person of great authority and great power, great inner energy. And I remember being really impressed by him uh, and by his creative process as a kid. I would watch it because he, he worked together with my parents. Uh, so I could witness how motifs for, for film were created and the whole dialogue around it, the whole process, the intera inter interaction. And I found it very exciting. And uh, so this was the first impulse and it came very early. Um, and uh, I think ever since then I decided to follow this path. Why did you study clarinet and percussion and not piano? Well, I started with the piano as a kid. Um, I studied it for six years and then um, I think at this point I must have been around 12. I already knew I want to compose. So the next step uh, for a composer is to learn as many instruments as possible. You don't have to be brilliant in playing these instruments, you just have to know them to be able to touch them, to be able to understand their inner logic. And I think this, having limited options at the age of 12, I decided for the clarinet it seemed to be an interesting um, change for me. Because every instrument has its own mentality, its own logic. Um, the piano is uh, is obviously the, the the king of instruments, and it uh, and it's very much about creating musical architecture. And the clarinet is a melodic instrument; it will make you follow a certain path. I think I was looking for that. That was probably the intuition at at this very young age. And then. Then there was percussion for some time, uh, also to experiment with, with uh, an experience, just a different musical approach and um, yeah, but this was, these were really, um, I think already at that point, these were choices made in conscious awareness of, of the fact that I want to follow uh, the path to become a, to become a composer. According to the Film Polski website, your first credit as composer was in 1995 for Climatic Climate. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? You were very young then. I was very young. Uh, I was 15. Um, and it was part of... Uh, well, the story was uh, that, that I was involved in... Uh, naturally involved in making films, making making uh, other audiovisual projects was just part of our family life and part of the family discussion and at some point I got involved in it, naturally. Uh, my parents were uh, people who appreciated uh, the perspective of a kid. They never discriminated against children. So um, I was, my, my opinions were just as welcome as the opinions of a, of a 40 year old. And uh, since I got involved in it, and I was musical, and I was composing all the time, and I knew this, and I was creating melodies and, and little, little miniatures, uh, um, I think that was the point at which they decided to give me a go. 
I was also already at that point involved with some of my friends uh, from school in working on um, amateur films. Uh, I have I have a good friend till today. He's a he's a f brilliant film director uh, nowadays. Uh, who um, who was starting uh, to make films at, as a teenager, and I was I was working with him. I was experimenting on on writing melodies for film. It was something that always excited me. So my parents knew about this, and it, it's just. Uh, I, I guess you can compare it to living in a circus, you know? Uh, if you're the kid of a juggler or a clown, you'll probably at some point start uh, juggling yourself, right? 24 years passed since so then, mm -hmm. and also the technical aspects of your work. Um, is it now easier? Well, I have experience. It makes things easier. I also have a great team of people who I collaborate with on a regular basis. This also gives gives me a certain sense of uh, of uh, of calmness. Um, but it's always a very unpredictable process. Each time I start working on a film, it's a blank page. I uh, don't have an archive of compositions that I would draw from. Uh, I really try to approach every project I'm involved in in a, in a very thorough and organic way uh, which means that there is always a sense of anxiety in the beginning because I know how powerful the tools are on, at my disposal and um, that I could do some harm to the film if I don't succeed in finding the right language or the right sound for, for, for the film. Is there more pressure now since you can compose everything on your laptop? Well, the laptop is um, is just a tool uh, to communicate with with the director. I usually, not always, but I usually compose scores for orchestra. Uh, this is my natural instrument. I experiment with electronic music as well. I sometimes combine it with orchestral music, mm, but mainly the computer computer generated music is a tool for me to create demos which then form a basis for discussion with the, with the director because we can try things out. So it gives me enormous flexibility. At the same time, one has to be careful not to let these technical tools overwhelm you because they are sometimes very seductive. They are, they are easy. Right now you really, you can download fantastic sample libraries where you push a button and the music plays by itself. You don't have to know anything about music to create things that sound uh, almost uh, as if they were composed by a professional. But this almost, it makes a difference. I try to control the tools I use, not let them control me. In recent years you composed music for films and series where your aunt is the director. How did the collaboration start? Was there any reluctance on your side to work with a family member? Well, I've, as I've said before, it was a natural part of our life. So I didn't, I didn't have any reluctance uh, to, to step into this. I didn't really analyze it that much at, the, at this very young age when I was starting. And at the same time, uh, I already started having, at, at a very young age, offers from, from other directors. Uh, I had a long period of collaboration with the German director by the name of Hans Steinbichler and uh, he invited me to his, uh, to his uh, debut film uh, and we made four films together and it was something that shaped me as a composer and also gave me this sense of, um, how to say that, that a kind of a proof that, that I have a certain quality, that the fact that I work with Agnieszka or uh, or my father, who, who I worked with as well, is not because we're related, it's because they appreciate what I'm doing and I have something to say as a composer. Mr. Jones, a new film by Agnieszka Holland, was shown in competition at the Berlin Film Festival. At what stage of that production did you get involved? Well, I got involved very early. I had... Um, I had um, one assignment which had to be prepared already during the shoot of the film 
uh, which is to compose a song for children in Ukraine. Um, and I was really eager to do this and excited to do this because it was a good um, good reason for me to go to the set. Uh, I, I like uh, visiting the set. I, I think this is where the film is born and this is where a certain energy is created. And you can learn a lot about the philosophy of the film just by listening to uh, the conversations between the, the the director and the DOP or the director and the state designer and so on. So this is this is a crucial stage. And if I am involved at, at this moment and I'm there, then a lot of discussions uh, and misunderstandings will be saved afterwards. Anyway, I was there, I was on set and I uh, I encountered these amazingly talented children and we practiced together and we created this song that was used in the film, that was back in winter during the shoot. And then after a couple of months break I came back and um, the way we work with Agnieszka usually is that we sit down together in her house um, during the summer because that's usually the season where the fin film is edited uh, together with the editor. The edit is prepared, it's not closed yet, it's not, it's not locked and I can um, get involved with my music, which means that I, I bring my uh, little studio with me. Uh, I compose in one, one room, the editing room is, is on the other side of the courtyard and I uh, bring my stuff there and they bring me new scenes and we try things out and this enables both sides to create things that are very much in sync and you have a sense of matching uh, pulses, matching rhythms uh, between music and, and the editing. Um, the editor for me is a very important partner in my work, a very important creative uh, partner. And um, after these couple of days I've spent in, in France with Agnieszka, the score was almost ready. And the last stage was really waiting for the picture to be locked, definitely, and then adjusting the, the pieces of music so that they really fit the final version of the, of the picture. Were temp tracks used by the editor or maybe your own music? In this case, um, Agnieszka and our editor Mike, they used uh, one fragment of my score to, previ to Agnieszka's previous film, In Darkness, as a temp track. And it was um, it. It's a piano piece, uh, and um, and it has a certain type of of quality and style. And I um, accepted it, and I composed something that is is very musically very different from the from that from that piece. But it I think fulfills the same role. So it was it was helpful. Though I generally try to avoid. Uh, using 10 tracks and I try to step in as early as possible to, to not to have to uh, rely on 10 tracks. Did she give you specific guidelines for the music for this film? Mm, with this film, well, there was a lot of discussion about this particular theme. It's a theme that reoccurs in the film. It's connected to, the, to, 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 to George Orwell in the film and also to the experience of uh, our main character slowly submerging himself in the world of Moscow communism, uh, his anxiety, his his sense of alienation, and and we spoke a lot about this because it was really important that I that I get the message and that, that I produce something that's um, that has strikes exactly the right tone. Uh, with the rest of the music, it was the other way. I proposed something very quickly, very early on, uh, which uh, which was very rhythmical and very uh, motoric, and it's the theme that appears all the way through London, through the train journey to to Moscow, and and then back when we're back in England, and it's this kind of um, overwhelming uh, chaotic uh, musical narrative that 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 I. Uh, um, I felt was appropriate for this story uh, and Agnieszka accepted it immediately. 
where the remarks in the script are ready for uh, placing the music. So um, maybe just like you said, um, we see Jones try, uh, taking the train and there uh, should not be any music. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. No, there were not no, no remarks like that in the film. It's, it rarely happens that I find uh, comments from the screenwriter uh, about music. This is really usually left uh, to the discretion of the director and and uh, happens between the director and me. Um, but I but but there was definitely uh, you know there, there were a couple of moments in the film which are musical and we, which which were already very inspiring when I was reading the script. One of them being the party at at, at Durantis. Uh, which has uh, um, a quite incredible music musical illustration created by uh, by the brilliant uh, jazz musician uh, by the name of Masetsky uh, and his partner Munarski, and they uh, they exist in many different. Uh, jazz combos but they're just uh, incredibly gifted uh, musicians and with the sense of of uh, decadence in music so uh, i had this idea to invite them to be to be uh, live musicians during this scene uh, which originally was written for more like a cocktail party with uh, maybe something playing on the on the gramophone so uh, yeah, so there were these these uh, points of inspiration that that we we uh, together we uh, let uh, let them evolve into something bigger. You talked already a little bit about your score. My feeling was um, that the title theme is somewhere similar to an orchestra warming up, mm -hmm. especially the strings mm -hmm. at the end. Um, what can you tell me about your score? Well, I think it is supposed to have a feeling of a kind of energetic potential. It's very kind of, it's supposed to be like very electrifying. It also draws a lot from, from the music of, of uh, pre-war modernism. And, um, and, and different avant-garde movements uh, of that time. And I consciously used uh, some elements of, of orchestration and some, some sounds uh, that I associated with, with this. Um, this particular period is, is a fascinating moment in history because it's, it was the transition between the first... Uh, revolutionary period which was actually very inspiring for artists and this and stalinism which was putting these artists in in jail or killing them or forcing them to to um, emigrate um, so we are in between these these times and i wanted this the sense of this particular period to be somehow present in my score so i was looking at, for that period as as inspiration and um, uh, also, um, there is a sense of, as as you notice, there is no almost no music during the Ukraine period of the film. The whole face is uh, has maybe two or three fragments of music which are very discreet and sometimes unrecognizable almost to to, to the viewer. And it was an intent to uh, let the viewer focus entirely. Uh, on on the sensual experience of of being there, so very much sound took over, uh, narrate narrating the music, uh, and uh, and there is silence. There is very little dialogue. You know, these some thirty minutes of film are maybe four or five pages of script. Uh, so there is very very little happening there, but there is tension, and this film is all about that because we are talking about a horrible atrocity, but we're also talking about someone who is a, a, a prophet, a ridiculed prophet, someone who is un, unlistened to, who no, nobody treats seriously, and he is, he is pre-telling a catastrophe that's going to happen very soon and on a global scale. Um, and there is 
there is this piece of music at the very end of the film, which starts with the piano. We have our main character walking into the fog in a very kind of classical Hollywood uh, finish. And we sort of smoothly um, let him fade out. Uh, and then the music continues for a while on the piano. And then we start having instruments emerging and entering and uh, combining together. And it ends with this almost unbearable noise musical noise, like multi-layered, lots of percussive instruments, lots of brass instruments, uh, really, really as loud as possibly. And it cuts very abruptly. And it was for me the, the synthesis of this film and the, the music, a uh, precognition of, of catastrophe. You talked already about sounds. Um, did you incorporate sounds in your score? Because sometimes also the feeling just like a hammer on mm -hmm. metal mm -hmm. clanging. Uh, yeah. What instruments did you use for the score? Well, uh, a part of the orchestra, uh, we had a lot of uh, percussive instruments, which you are referring to to some extent. Uh, that enabled us to, we improvised on them and I also work with, with uh, a duo of, of uh, percussionists who are very inventing, uh, inventive in, in their um, approach to, to playing and I can always rely on them bringing uh, some weird instrument with them that will have a special sound. So we we, sp we were speaking about this uh, before uh, starting to record and they, they, they brought a lot of different instruments and we created these weird sounds uh, uh, on them. And then we had one uh, true surprise during our recording sessions. Um, there is the, uh, the main character, he plays a so-called jaw harp. And uh, for technical reasons, we needed to record, uh, re-record this, this playing for the scenes. There are two scenes where he plays it. And we invited uh, this, this guy by the name of Joško Broda, who is a, a multi-instrumentalist and a, a brilliant folk musician, a musician uh, coming from a, a family of folk musicians with, with uh, like endless tradition. And he's a virtuoso of the jaw harp, and he knows everything about this instrument, which is uh, fascinatingly an instrument, one of the most ancient instruments uh, in human history. And you can fi will find it everywhere around the world, from South America to Australia to East Asia, Sibi Siberia, uh, the Balkans. Uh, and uh, and he uh, so he brought some like forty or fifty of these with him, different models, different makings. And he started warming up and then he, st to, because you have to warm your mouth before you perform. So he, he started uh, warming this up, uh, his lips up, and we realized he's able to create such an incredible sound with this instrument that we're going to use him not only for the, for this little scene that we need him for, but also for, for the score. And, um, and for the train journey to, to Moscow, and it is his instrument, the jaw harp, that actually dominates the whole sound. This is what create, creates the rhythm, the pulsation, the sense of, of a moving train. That's actually this incredible musician creating it with his lips and this little uh, metal thing, thingy. Uh, so that was, that was an incredible encounter. And sometimes I feel humbled when I meet uh, people like that because I feel that they have more, sometimes more musical power uh, with these very simple means than I have with a 50-person orchestra. There are scenes in the film where Agnieszka Holland overlays the train ride with um, pieces of Soviet propaganda films mm -hmm. and there is no music. Why not? Because I thought, or well, maybe as a counterpoint, we can hear the typical Soviet-style propaganda music. <laughs> there is music in this scene, actually. Yeah? Yes, yes. That's actually the scene I'm, I was speaking about. But it's so rhythmical and so mixed with, with the sound design, the train sound design, that the viewer may not even recognize it as music. I, I didn't recognize it. Uh, well, it's, 
It's there and it's quite loud, I assure you. Alles klar. Um, Mr. Jones has a duration of 141 minutes. Mm -hmm. How much music did you compose for the film? Well, not that much. Altogether, we have uh, we had some 50 minutes of recordings, um, from which I think we eliminated one or two, which means, uh, in my estimate, the film has around 45 minutes of score, which is um, a bit less than average. Uh, but then I think the score is uh, used in a way in which it feels very present and very significant. So sometimes less is more. Was there a scene where you struggled a while to find the right tune? Um, I think generally the piano theme, that was, that was the challenge. Uh, and, I, and I spoke about it already a little bit. And um, the rest of it went pretty smoothly, I would say. I think I have a feeling it's a very clear narrative. It's a very concise story. I know what it needs, needs and I'm in agreement with, with the director. So we had a fairly harmonious uh, collaboration on this one. You talked about the song for the children's choir. Mm -hmm. Did you also wrote um, the text? No, the text is uh, has an interesting story. I am unable to tell it in detail. Uh, this film had a whole group of amazing uh, historical consultants and also musical consultants. And uh, one of our historians found this um, this couplet of um, these satirical poems Uh, which were obviously banned by the Stalinist authorities, uh, which were uh, just ridiculing uh, Stalin and um, and telling the story of the Holodomor. And it's a whole series. It's it's like a cabaret piece, uh, a bit chaotic, but with these with these um, crazy metaphors, and it. It struck us as something that would really fit our film, but we didn't know yet how to use it. And then uh, there was the scene in which Garrett encounters a group of children, and it wasn't certain in the script what the children are doing with him, how, how they interact, and I suggested that they could maybe sing him a song. And uh, then we were trying to find the song, and then we realized maybe maybe this is the right spot for for this fragment of of folk po poetry to be used. Uh, but then no music existed for it, so so I composed it. Did you orchestrate your score? I worked together with uh, my assistant Piotr Komarowski, uh, and we orchestrated the score together. Um, it was. Uh, an assignment that required um, at some point a very tight deadline. In these cases I, uh, I employ uh, um, Piotr who, who, who is an incredible assistant because he, um, he knows my style very well and I can rely on him. Um, the process of orchestrating a score like that Uh, has many stages and um, I uh, determine the orchestration and um, I choose the instruments and I choose the harmonies and so on but then there is the, the stage of um, of writing it down and and trans well transferring transferring my my idea on, onto paper and as much as I usually love to do it myself uh, When forced by time to do it, I uh, I have to rely on someone who is able to do it well and in uh, accordance with my vision. And Piotr is a person like that. And I'm really lucky to have found him. We've worked together on my recent three projects. And uh, uh, it's a very kind of artistically intimate relationship. 
I'm changing now a little bit the, the suspect. Mm -hmm. um, streaming services are seen in a way as a threat mm -hmm. for cinema or linear TV. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think it's. Um, I've recently read an article uh, about um, referring to to precisely to Austria for some reason, but but the interesting. Um, process that happened that was kind of counterintuitive was uh, with the emergence of streaming services such as Netflix etc uh, the amount of people going to cinema has risen um, we don't and this is it's a paradox that we also know from the from the music industry in which uh, streaming services uh, like Spotify in some cases have uh, uh, inspired people to buy records, more records. Um, we, I think, we as consumers of, of music or film, we don't act in predictable and linear ways, which means that we still want to experience uh, art on, on different levels. And I cannot imagine that uh, even the most efficient uh, streaming service will ever replace the excitement of going to cinema. I know my kids have access to Netflix and other streaming services, but they, if they want to see a film together with their friends, they, they buy a ticket. And, uh, and the more they watch uh, on streaming services, the more they become interested in directors in actors uh, want to follow them and so it's actually I see it as a generally as a positive uh, positive element uh, although it requires control it requires regulation it's crucial for us as creatives to um, have a f sense of uh, security uh, a sense that our rights are protected and this is not just for our private interest not only for us to earn money but most of all for us to be able to provide our talent to the audiences so it's common interest how important is netflix as a stepping stone in a career because uh, your music will be heard instantly by millions it's yes it's something that's quite overwhelming i can't even imagine uh, the the amount of people who who have recently uh, been able to listen to my film music um, so it is but it's a bit abstract you know it's a bit uh, it's out there but I don't uh, sense it that much uh, it's not that people will be uh, uh, coming up to me on the street and ask me about my score and um, I think uh, I really appreciate I just recently worked uh, on a theater play again after a couple of years and and this kind of very direct interaction with the audiences was something that that was really exciting to me um, and career wise it's it's hard to say I think I have a very good moment in my career right now uh, with a lot of very exciting and interesting projects coming my way and the main positive uh, that I see is that people approach me because they recognize that I have a certain quality as, as a film composer and they uh, are, are hoping for me to provide this quality to, to the film. You recently composed the score for the first season of 1983 and uh, Netflix series. How does Netflix, as an overseer in a way, handles the use of film music? Are they are better, or maybe as a um, film production? Um, well, I think they are comparable to a television network, uh, and. Um, I really like their mentality. It's interesting because they, as a company, they have uh, not only a huge amount of, of products, of, of productions, but they also have a lot of information about their viewers. And they're not, um, but they're not the big brother. 
uh, they are not uh, limiting the creatives to the preconceived models. Uh, I think they have learned that actually the the element element of disruption and element of uh, of ingenuity is crucial to their success, which translated into them giving uh, me personally a lot of uh, creative freedom, and only interfering in situations in which uh, they felt that. Um, on a very kind of technical level, my music may uh, disrupt the scene, or but there was honestly very few instances in which they, I would be receiving precise comments on music. They, they, uh, our, our collaboration started with me providing them with an idea of 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 musical themes and the sound of the of the whole like the style, the musical style, and we spoke about it. They accepted it. As th this idea, this premise, and uh, then I just fulfilled it really uh, throughout the, sc the score. So there were no no reasons for them to be uh, upset. How about the, um, I would say the psychology or the um, style of the music? Because an American audience is um, has films which have a lot of film music and we here in Europe have very little. Mm -hmm. Did, was there any consideration of that in scoring the series? Well, we all knew it is a genre series and it's an action series uh, with a lot of twists and with also deeper layers, but generally it is, it is an action series. So we have to approach it in this... Um, I would say more American way, mm. but uh, I think uh, well, it is a different premise. It means that you start with, and I've had that that I had I had episodes in which my first draft of composition had a score almost completely covering the the episode. So we would have that as the first kind of scaffolding and then we would be removing some elements from it. Anywhere where we felt that a certain scene doesn't need music or that there's maybe too much, uh, we would just take out either layers or entire uh, musical cues. Um, yes, but the, the episodes, they have a lot of music, usually around some 45 minutes of score 40-45 minutes uh, in a 55-minute episode. It's a lot. Um, and uh, that's actually something that I really enjoyed. It's very exciting to, to, to experiment with this kind of musical narrative in which you really lead the viewer through the whole experience. How much time did you have to finish an episode? Well, it's it will be hard to count it because I got involved with the first cut of each episode and I would prepare a kind of a mock-up of, of music already back then and then the episode would be re-edited a couple of times and I would do versions of, of, of my music accordingly to, to the new edits. So sometimes I would create three or four versions of, of a score. Um, because everything was intertwined, the music usually connects scenes, which means that if scene A uh, that was before scene B uh, ends up after the scene B, I have to make a new connection, a new bridge. Um, yes, well, altogether my work lasted uh, some seven, eight months. So if you divided it by the amount of episodes, we would have around a month of work on, on an episode. Um, I looked up the credits for the series on the IMDb mm -hmm. and it says one episode by Marcin Mazetsky and eight by you. What did he do? Well, uh, Marcin Mazetsky, uh, you remember I referred to him in, in Mr. Jones. He was invited to perform in a scene uh, of the episode and um, his music, his improvisation uh, was put on top of my music. So we effectively created a piece of music that lasts some seven minutes that's composed by the two of us. Uh, so that was his involvement. Your wife and you are the music producers of the series. Can mm -hmm. we expect a soundtrack release? 
Well, there have been some talks about it, uh, and and I'm receiving a lot of uh, questions from fr- fans of the series about the release, and uh, I. Hmm. Well, I hope it will happen. I am trying to make it happen. How about the second season? Will you be scoring that too? Well, from uh, as far as I know, I'm considered to be the composer for yes, for the entire series. That's great <laughs> because I'm one of the fans. So. Okay. <laughs> um, how about the music for the series? Because um, in the start we have some subtle maybe piano, uh-huh. very subtle piano, yeah. and then for the younger members, for the terrorists, mm-hmm. so to say, we have kind of techno mm-hmm. music. Mm-hmm. Um, why that? Well, uh, you try to, when you have such a multi-layered story, like 1983, you try to introduce some logic into it, musically, to help the viewer. So each of each set of characters has their own theme and their own slightly different set of instruments and set of sounds uh, so that we can also follow them musically. Um, so there is a piano theme which is mostly associated with the with the with the events happening 20 years earlier. Uh, we have our uh, light brigade uh, theme. Uh, which is, as you said, very kind of industrial uh, uh, techno, and then we have the whole world of the secret police and the and the military, which has its own instruments, which are heavier, darker, um, more threatening, and uh, and then you know the, there will be characters emerging in the middle of the season uh, who would have uh, their own little teams and it's just something that I would do first of all to have some order in in the whole in the whole narrative and also to be able you know the fun is when you start mashing things up when you start p- putting things on top of each other and trying to to fit them uh, to each other and there is a lot of that in this call there are also um, is a Vietnamese cast in the mm. series mm. but I don't remember a Vietnamese or Asian Asian song Well, there is there is a, there is a theme that's associated with our with the uncle. Uh, I didn't want to create a kind of ethno uh, mood in the film. I, in the series, I think this is a bit too cliche. And also, what's interesting about these people is that they are um, already part of the society, an integral part, which means that they. Mm, they're not supposed to feel exotic. How about the source music? Because in the first episode, um, it starts with news from TVP. Mm-hmm. Um, is it your tune or <laughs> the standard tune for the news? No, that's that's actually mine. Yeah, yeah. I, I I did a lot of things that are like jingles and stuff, which are also part of the of the world. You know, I composed the choir uh, anthems that are sung in the second episode and uh, so that was also you know very very fun to do to to try and create the uh, three-dimensional world of this of this alternative reality including its music why didn't you compose the music for the series the first uh, well it uh, it's um, <laughs> Um, hard to say. Uh, I think I think it's uh, you know usually it's the producer's call with series, and uh, they often have uh, the role of the director. You're asking this because Agnieszka yeah. uh, co-directed this, uh, but the role of the director in such cases is is a bit different than than in um, in uh, projects which are auteur. Um, the producer actually calls the shots, and and I assume that that the producer had had a specific musical idea. I haven't seen the series yet. I'm really eager to see it and excited about it because I've heard a lot from Agnieszka about it. But um, I also understand that it's very much as um, as submerged in a certain local. Um, environment which also brings its music to it so probably that would be the answer 
you also worked on the series uh, Rosemary's Baby mm -hmm. with your wife. Um, can you tell me what difference does, do you see in the in working for the US and in working here in Europe? Mm, it was a very special experience, Rosemary's Baby. Uh, it's a mini series, a two episode special. Uh, made for NBC and aired in primetime television, which has its own requirements. Uh, I wasn't really aware of this when I started working on this, and um, since the production was quite, I would say, chaotic with, with producers, the original producers, they got fired from the, from the production for some reasons that I, I don't, don't know much about. Um, somebody else replaced them. Uh, the shooting was happening in great haste and, and kind of a lot of tension around it, uh, logistically and in terms of organization. Um, so the, the music was kind of, um, I would say, orphaned. Uh, not really, uh, not really uh, supervised a lot. Uh, they just gave me a budget and uh, I had a conference call with a dozen people who I've never seen in my life and uh, they had some remarks and I created a set of demos and I sent it to them and they signed off and then I went to the studio and knowing that this is going to be happening very quickly and uh, that I have to be flexible, I recorded uh, as much music as I could, a huge amount of music, a library of music of some something like maybe three and a half hours of different themes, different tempi, uh, things that could maybe be put on top of each other, choir, little orchestra, some percussive instruments, the piano and so on and so on. So I had this with me, I had a very precise list of all these pieces and with the description, this is like the mystery theme, this is, you know, like tags really, uh, that would would enable me to, to, to juggle between them. And then I went to LA um, for a period that was orig originally intended to be something like seven days and ended up being around three weeks um, for the edit uh, to, to actually put this score on, on the picture. And it was like building on, on moving sands because the picture was constantly uh, being re-edited. Uh, we were sitting in a studio where there were four or five editing rooms and uh, me with, with the, the music editor of the series and uh, some other post-production and we were getting de delivered new versions of this of the picture constantly, like every couple of hours, uh, which would require us to constantly reshape the music and re-edit the music. And um, I was able to do that only thanks to the fact that I had this huge reservoir of music and, and we had a really brilliant musical editor, very experienced in it. But these were like 14, 15 hour days, working days, under huge pressure up to the very last deadline. Um, and I think res the result was uh, was great. I was I'm really happy with it, um, but it was quite exhausting. And at some points, I was I had this impression that hmm, maybe this is not the best workflow, uh, the most creative workflow. Uh, but this is just something that the stakes are so high uh, with such uh, productions um, that. Um, everybody is trying to kind of cover their tracks. What kind of workflow do you um, like most? Um, a production that is where the picture is locked and then you come in? Mm -hmm. Or where you um, early involved from the script on? I like both ways. Uh, I uh, Right now I'm stepping into a production which is uh, uh, in which I will only have around six weeks to complete the score and the film is they're just locking the picture right now um, so this will be a very um, energetic high adrenaline uh, workflow and I like it because it makes I think it makes us all more intuitive less conceptual which is great um, and um, 
that's uh, that's one example. But I've I've worked with uh, with directors who prefer to to have music in uh, on their iPhone uh, during the shoot. So I would be asked to compose a theme for a film before the shooting started, and that's also fun because I know that I'm already I'm already kind of working with the uh, with the imagination. I'm influencing the imagination of the director. That's that's a great thing to do. Why are you based in Berlin? Uh, it's uh, it's a question I, I'm being asked uh, once in a while, and I absolutely not, don't know how to answer. I love this city. Uh, it's my home. Uh, it's uh, it's a great refuge for me. I haven't worked that much in Berlin or on Berlin film projects. Uh, but um, that's actually a, a good thing uh, for my life because I have a separation between work and and home life, family life. And uh, uh, well, it's a it's a very inspiring city, and it's a city that uh, also I privately appreciate very much. Uh, its atmosphere of tolerance and uh, uh, its cosmopolitan flair. Uh, I think it's something very important for an artist to be able to to draw from that. In your opinion, does the Polish government uh, is doing enough to support the film industry? Well, the, the Polish government is doing a lot to try and destroy the Polish film industry uh, or its freedoms. Um, but there are people who uh, who are trying to do good under these dire circumstances. Uh, what's been happening in recent years is an incredible renaissance of Polish cinema. And it's grown to be one of the truly greatest and, and most uh, um, exciting cinematographies in Europe. And uh, I'm very proud and happy to be part of it. Mm. But there are politicians who don't really appreciate uh, uh, a lot of free-thinking artists, and um, and our government is trying to uh, shape uh, the uh, narrative around history of Poland, especially uh, by telling their set set of comforting lies to to the audiences. Uh, so far, we've succeeded in uh, in keeping them at bay. Uh, the good thing, which is the usual story, you know, usually nationalists, uh, they are their narratives are so false that it's impossible to create good stories out of these ideas. So I think this is their ultimate failure. Um, you know they've taken over. They've taken over institutions, but they they just they're just intellectually unable to create anything that people would want to see, want to watch. So as long as as they uh, don't find the uh, um, truly talented uh, artists, um, we're quite safe. I would say. Das ist die Musik zu äh, Burning Bush. Wenn ich mich, mich nicht über. Ähm, äh, äh, warte ganz kurz. Das ist es, oder? Der ja. Jäger des Augenblicks. Ah, <lacht> okay. <lacht> okay. Ja, klar, natürlich. 
So, und das nächste. Das ist Rosemary's Baby. Genau. Vielleicht noch das Thema als Bonuspunkt. Das ist die Schwierigkeitsgrad. Äh, das wird wahrscheinlich, oh, ich erinnere mich nicht mehr, wie ich sie benannt habe, die Themen. Aber die Szene kenne ich ganz genau. Das ist so ein, am Anfang der Serie, äh, unsere Hauptdarstellerin kommt nach Paris. Genau, Place de la Coco. Genau. So. Ich glaube, das ist relativ einfach. Ja, das hier. ist der Song von Mary called uh, City of My Dreams. So, das nächste. Das ist Spore. Genau, das Thema. Mm, ah, wieder äh, äh, Titel äh, werde ich dir nicht sagen. Okay, aber, aber Spore war richtig. Ja. Horse heißt das Stück. Wie? Horse. Ah, The Horse, okay. <lacht> okay, noch eins, dann sind wir gleich durch. Ja. So, ne? Ich mach das mal drin. Das ist ein Darkness. Ich weiß nicht, wie, wie das aus. Ich habe mir hier aufgeschrieben im Jastor 44. Ah, okay, dann ist es nicht in Darkness. Das ist, äh, äh, auf Deutsch hieß es äh, Warschau 44. Genau. Der Film. Mhm. Ja. <lacht> naja, Danke. das wäre eine, eine schwache 2-. <lacht> ich vergebe Sternchen.